Okay, greetings. This is Mark Austin, and I'm here with Prince Paul Raj, and we're going to talk a little bit about our journey on AI, AI modernization, and the application to fraud with Databricks. Uh, so to start out, uh, let me just give you, we'll, we'll start out with a little bit of history on, uh, you know, AT&T and our history of AI. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background on the fraud problem and why it's so challenging and why we need something like Databricks. Um, and then we'll talk about different pieces of the strategy. So think of these as different pieces of the modernization in terms of creating AI, which is creating models and features, deploying and serving it um, to make sure it's real time, um, monitoring it, and then governing it. That will be all about the bias and explainability. And then we'll wrap up with some, with some conclusions at the end. So let me uh, just do a quick, quick flyover of AT&T's history in AI. Um, this is part of our modernization. You're going to see some, some AI stuff here, some technology stack as well, but you could even go back to the 50s, right? Um, Claude Shannon started looking at AI to solve the chess problem, auto playing chess. And then in 1955, the actual term artificial intelligence, um, it was AT&T, IBM, Harvard, and Dartmouth that first coined that term. And then in the 70s, some of the technology stack that we all know and love, you know, Unix, C, um, C++, of course, S, which turned into R, you know, first one of the st statistical programming languages for data science that was out of the 70s. And then in the 1980s and 90s, we have the neural network foundational work. Uh, Jan LeCun out of the labs was, was looking at convolutional neural nets there. And then in the 2000s, it's all been about applying AI, of course, to fraud and many other things. Um, we, of course, you know, AT&T has got wireless and HBO Max and, and fiber. And then in the, in the 2000s as well, um, there was a, a pretty important hackathon, you know, the Netflix competition was like a million dollars and, and Chris Valinsky out of our group um, and team won that competition for the recommender algorithm there. So in terms of applying AI, one of the most important ones to apply it to has been the fraud problem. And fraud is so big, it's a billion dollar issue for the industry. And there's many different things that fraudsters go after here. I'm just showing a few of these here. Of course, you have the gaming fraud. This is where there's no intention to pay. Um, identity theft is huge. You know, the, the fraudsters getting stuff out of the dark web, getting credentials, masquerading as, as the customer. Um, so we got to detect that. And of course, these there's the obvious bribing and impersonating the customer or, or getting illegal unlocks to be able to, to get the phones there as well. Now, technically, um, you have to detect all these things. And in the past, years ago, we used to use rules. And yes, we, we found a lot of things. You can kind of catch those things. But it's really been the advance of applying the machine learning and AI, which has really made a dent. Now, years ago, you know, we started with rules, like you can see here. And then we started applying machine learning. You could see the fraud stops going down. That's the line. Um, kind of going down there with machine learning one through machine learning five. And we, we were so successful that we, we just put more on that. And I haven't even put the latest on here, but you can see the year after that, we added 20 more algorithms, knocked the fraud down. And the fraud's like dropping here that you can look at like the percentage is probably down like 70, 80% versus just the rules alone. So hugely successful here, but it's all about doing this at speed, doing it in real time. And from a technical challenge, um, there's, you know, for any kind of purchase, there's multiple kind of side transactions that go off. So we have to monitor all of these actual transactions. And when you add these up, believe it or not, it's about 10 million transactions per day that we have to score likelihood to be fraud on. Um, and we have to do this fast. We have to do it in 50 milliseconds or less so that it's not a delay for the customer. And when we're doing this, it's amounts in, in capturing hundreds of real-time features, API calls, driver's license checks, variety of other things on there. And then it's you know probably four times as many batch features, all of these things, grabbing them real-time, scoring these things and making that call. Now, in terms of the process, and this is what we're gonna dive down a bit more, um, doing all this in a platform like Databricks and Spark, doing this in real-time that we can score these things is super important. And this is what our modernization is around. And if you broke it into the three components, you might say it's, you could call it, 
it starts with creating the AI that's getting the data, developing the features, building the models, and then deploying and serving it. That's the pipeline, deploying the model, and then, then monitoring the AI at the end, making sure it's doing what you intended to do. And of course, you can't forget the govern AI in, in the middle there too. We have to make sure that everything we do is, is done in an unbiased way. It's explainable, it's interpretable. So this is kind of the overall process. And we're gonna dive down into each one of these things. We'll show you a bit of the technology stack, a bit of, a bit of our strategy, um, so a mix of kind of uh, external and internal uh, technologies to actually do this. So let's, let me start out with Create AI. So Create AI, um, again, this is about creating the features, creating the models, of course, Spark is amazing for that. You can, you can do batch, you can do real time, you can do the Spark streaming there, um, but then you're actually creating the features. And this is where um, sharing and cataloging those in a common place becomes super, super important. We even look on our own team and sometimes we'll have two data scientists almost on the same team creating almost the same features. So we found that it's super important to get those in a shared place Delta Lake is great for that, but even further, when you wanna serve that in a real time, you need something like a feature store, right? So you can serve online and offline and you can serve these features up for your actual scoring of, of your actual models. Now, building the models is really two pieces and that's these, these boxes on the right there. Individually, a data scientist wants to be able to try many different things. They wanna try different hyperparameters. They wanna try different models. So we have the auto ML stuff like H2O driverless AI. That's kind of the automatic thing, but we're also gonna have our own thing. So individually a data scientist is gonna try to get the best thing they can do. But what we found, if a model is super important, like in, in stopping fraud where 1% could be millions of dollars of savings, you almost wanna put that out to the crowd as well. And that's the piece on the bottom right. So Pinnacle, think about that after you have the best one you kind of crowdsource it out. And if I go to the next slide, you create a competition or a collaboration and you put this model out for people to compete on. So think of this as our own internal Kaggle where everybody's kind of competing on a model, different features, maybe different data and different models to get the best it can be. So we, this has been hugely successful for us. We've found on, on some of these important models um, on average, we've done over 200 of these competitions. We've improved the accuracy by about 29%. Um, we've got about 1,100 people that are on the platform that get the notice. Not all of them show up to compete, but many times it's not uncommon to have 70 or 80 people competing on an algorithm here. Of course, we have the auto ML uh, bots, you know, H2O, driverless AI is, is, is one. And we've benchmarked about 4,700 of these models. And that's what's resulted in the 29% improvement. So that's a bit of the Create AI. Uh, of course, what's important next is to deploy and serve it. And I'm gonna hand it over to Prince to talk about that. Thank you, Mark. So I'm gonna talk about the next puzzle in the machine learning pipeline, that is deploy and serve AI. So before I touch about the model deployment, I just wanna talk about the model offline training. Most of the time our data scientists you know, have a problem that they want to travel back in time and create the features or sometimes backfilling the features. Those are very critical components of our fraud ML. So we need to have that sort of a capability in terms of the technology. And of course, Delta Lake, it's doing a great job there for helping us. So now talking about the model deployment, once the model has been built and that needs to be you know, recorded, we need to understand the model lineage. What features actually going into the model is very important and then version those models. So it gives an opportunity for us, when you're really working on the AB model framework or champion challenger mode, we need to just roll back and switch the versions. So it's very important for us to track the version of the model and ML flow and H2 ML ops, those are all the tools that's really helping us part of this model deployment. The next one to talk about is the model online scoring. So as important, you know, talking about this lightning fast, and things needs to happen in 50 milliseconds. So the online scoring is very important because we might pre-compute some of the features in offline, but you know, store them in the offline feature store like Redis. So then also enable some of the streaming features and actually compute them in a real runtime, right? 
So it's very important for us to give the high scalability and at lightning fast. So if you look at the offline uh, feature store and the off online feature store, we have at at and called Atlantics, that's an enterprise level feature store that's really helping us and syncing the data between online and offline and serving at a runtime, that's really helping us a lot. And of course, we are using a Delta Lake for our offline feature store. And the fourth thing that's very important is about the feature governance. So like Mark mentioned, you know, the data scientists in our team, you know, we don't want them to recreate the features many times. So we need to provide a metadata layer where data scientists can go and search if some of the features already exist and reuse them, right? Or maybe they enhance the features. So with a great, you know, access control in place and also monitoring these features health with the statistics and also do the compliance and legal, those are all very important, you know, challenges that we have part of the feature governance. So I'm going to dig a little deeper about the Atlantics. So if you look at the at and you know, we have multiple data pipeline in place. If you think about the machine learning point of view, we have a Databricks, we have Snowflake, we have in-house Pinnacle Kaggle platform, and we have a H2O driverless, and also Jupyter, right? So we have different model pipeline. The data scientists can get into any one of the pipeline, either they are consuming the data or processing the data in a batch mode or real-time mode, they have to create these features, but really we need a feature store as centralized fashion where people can actually consume and, and reuse it, right? At the model scoring point of view or model training point of view. So that's why there is a big need for us to have a centralized offline feature store that's really helping us, you know, when data scientists working on different pipeline, how we can reuse them across the enterprise. So one of the great benefits that what we got from the feature store at our enterprise level the whole way of doing is the batch learning. I mean, most of the time you do the batch learning, right? So you create a snapshot, a static data, and you split them training and, and testing, and you evaluate the model. If you look at the chart here, you can look at the blue line. That's basically the model has been trained at offline, and it's tested and evaluated. And look at the line, the ROC curve. And then actually when you deploy it in production, you can look at the green line. It's not performing as expected, right? So that's where, especially on the fraud cases, and it's very adversarial in nature, we have to build and retrain the model even in online, right? So that's why the concept of online learning or incremental learning come to the play. And this feature store, because we are keeping all this data offline and online in one place, that's really helping us. That's really enabling our data science to do the online learning. So that's the you know, wonderful uh, benefit that what we're having this enterprise level feature store. So now I'm going to talk about the monitor AI. So it is very important for us to monitor all the machine learning models in fraud space, uh, because in a fraudster, they come up with a different scheme of the things and they can really challenge you. So we have to monitor the data, the model, and also the infrastructure and the process around it, right? So when I talk about the data, the data drifting, it's really a very important thing because there is upstream systems that's pushing the data to your pipeline. So you need to know, you know, some important, very strong features, maybe that values is missing or invalid. You got to know, you need to notify your data scientists, right? So we are using MLOps there. And then about also the model drifting point of view, right? The performance of the model is very important for us, right? And when we see some sort of a drifting happens and we were able to visualize that and monitor the health of the model and let know the data scientists, let know the AI engineers, and when that things has happened. So we really need to you know, monitor the data, what the data that goes into the model, as well as the model, you know, what is what is the thing. And now we talk about the infrastructure. Always these models are deployed on some physical machine, right? Either on premises on, or cloud. But at the end of the day, you have to look at the system performance as well. So what is the CPU? What is the RAM? What is the IO usage, right? And always these models are wrapped as a microservices. What if the VM goes down? Right? What is the network connectivity is bad? So you need to correlate along with the data and model, also your infrastructure. Then the process is something that's really helping you, how you can actually coordinate this all and correlate them and create the necessary remediation or actions, right? And we want to provide direct and drop functionality to our data scientists and AI engineers, and they can shut the threshold, you know, when the breaches happen and things like that. And then also take some automated remediations, like maybe give an indication to our data scientists to retrain the model, right? And especially during the online training piece. 
And sometimes you want to perform the A-B testing um, or champion challenger mode, or even you want to roll back the model, right? So all those things is, is an important part of the process point of view. So the workflow of action is really helping us. So what we are doing there is we are putting an AI to monitor the AI. So if I take a little deep dive about the watchtower, uh, that is our internal platform that we built in. Um, like you know, I talked about in the previous slide, we monitor data, model, infrastructure. And this is an end-to-end -end platform actually is helping us to do it in a real-time manner, right? You can look at the drifting that happens. When, when Mark mentioned 10 million transactions get scored, I mean, you never know, you know, the model drifting happens in real time. One particular features that can really, you know, damage the model as well, you know, how important is what it's really matter. So if you look at it in the right hand side, we collect all the instrumentation, the logs from the models, the data, what features is going into the model and how it is the scoring is happening and the system we collect all those sort of a telemetry, the logs, and then we set up the monitoring in place. Then through this, our machine learning model plan, uh, framework, we take the decisions, right? So the decision will tell us to take the actions. Some of the actions are in automated fashions. We go on to retrain the model or, you know, we go on to reboot the server. It depends what sort of a problem it comes in. And based on the feedback, the intelligence on the model is keep learning and continuously learning about these all outages and the monitoring capabilities. And over the period of time, that's really getting sharpened and in real-time fashion, when real-time transactions are happening in milliseconds, this is really helping us to take actions immediately. The last one to talk about is the Gaon AI. Okay, this is all about understanding the bias, fairness, and transparency. If you look at an at and you know, we have a kind of a workflow in place. When a, when a use case or a machine learning model come to the play, we have a framework where we just get into learn about in the past what has been done. Right, and then we document it from the legal point of view, the privacy standpoint, and the process standpoint. And the real place is where we are evaluating the model. We understanding what is the biasness. If we detect some sort of a biasness, can we mitigate that? You know, if you mitigate it, most of the time, if you debias the model, I mean, how well it is, you know, performing after the fact you debias it. It also matters. And also, we use some of the, you know, vendor tools, the open source tools, to understand the model explainability, and also the data drift. Because end of the day, our business user needs to take a decision, even if the unbiased model is doing a good job or not, and what sort of a features is you know providing importance to the model prediction. So all this plays, you know, all this the points that I talked about. It's all in one framework, and that's how we govern the AI. So we covered create AI, and deploy and serve AI, and monitor AI, and also the govern AI. Back to you, Mark. So thanks, Prince. I think you gave a great view of the deploy, serve, and monitor, why that's important as well. Of course, throughout this whole talk, you've seen not only our journey, you've seen how important it is for fraud. You've seen kind of the 10 million transactions doing this in real time um, and doing it fast as well. So a bit of the technology stack. We love, we love what Databricks is bringing. We love the, you know, the, the Delta Lake. We love the ML flow. All of those are super important here. We like the advancements. You can see in a little bit of the things that we've done for external, internal things to kind of close it off, but we'd love to hear others' thoughts on this and, and I hope it was useful. Thank you.